Okay, hello and welcome to Expo Lingua Online Spring Edition. I'm Ekaterina and together with my colleague Sebastian Schattenmann, we organize Expo Lingua events and we are about to start our opening event, but let's wait a couple of moments until everyone can uh, join us. In the meantime, please write us in the chat, maybe a short hello, uh, can you hear and see us and please use the option send to all panelists and uh, attendees so that everyone, including today's uh, visitors, can read your messages. Okay, very well. Um, hello again and welcome, willkommen, hosh geldenis, dabro pajalovets, bienvenidos y bienvenidos to Expo Lingua Spring Edition. It was supposed to be a small event um, as we planned it initially, but in the end we have a four days live program and today we start with our opening session. And now I would like to give the word to Ian McMaster. Thank you very much, Ekaterina. Ian McMaster here. I'm in Munich and I'm the editor in chief of a business communications magazine called Business Spotlight. Um, I'm delighted to be able to uh, open this um, kickoff event at the, I believe it's the first spring um, Expo Lingua. Um, so that's a, that's a real honor. And we have a real pleasure for you today. We have a panel a panel of um, not only extremely expert and competent, but also very entertaining contributors. We've had a lot of fun even in the 10 minutes before we started. So we're spread around the world. We have, uh, we have uh, Maria, Richard, Anya and Steve here. They will all introduce themselves later, tell you a little bit more about, more about themselves and also tell you where they are. So the idea for, for this session is that each of us are going to give a very short input of around five to maximum six minutes. And we're each going to answer three questions. And these are, what have we learned about ourselves as language learners and teachers in 2020? Uh, what are the new tendencies that we've seen that we think will probably stay around for a while? And what do we wish or advise um, language learners and language professionals? Um, now, I'm just going to briefly answer the first two of those questions, and then when the other contributors have finished, I'm going to add my wish at the end, and then we will have time, hopefully we'll have 10 minutes or so at least for some questions, your questions from the chat, so do ask us anything you want, pick up any points from there. So very briefly, what have I learned about myself, or what did I learn about myself in 2020 as a language learner and teacher? Well, I think I learned that I'm not a particularly good um, language learner in some ways. I had a lot of time on my hands at home um, and a lot of people said they were gonna learn a new language. I, I neither said that nor did it. Um, in my defense, I could say like a lot of people working at home, we felt like we were actually spending more time working than we were when we were in the office and therefore the time and energy left over. But as I'm sure my colleagues here will tell me, that's a pretty poor excuse. Um, as a language teacher, I think what I learned, I'm not in, in full-time teaching at the moment, but I, what I think I learned was that I'm part of an extremely um, dynamic and, and agile, as we say nowadays, community who were able to, uh, in many cases, turn their, turn their whole way of uh, working and their business models upside down in a short space of time and adapt very quickly to the new reality of online teaching, online training. Um, what tendencies do I think will probably stay? Well, I mean, there are some obvious ones in the sense that um, online remote learning instruction is clearly here to stay in a much bigger way than many people maybe thought beforehand. I think what will be interesting for me to see, particularly in the area that I work in, which is, um, if you like, business English, business communication, is to what extent can the, this technology and remote learning and instruction, in what way can it teach sort of deeper communication skills, soft skills, so combining, um, combining the language with the, with the, with the sort of meta-language, meta meta-paralinguistic uh, uh, phenomena, and actually help people to improve their, their communication skills beyond the simple, simply the learning of the, of the, the words and the, and the grammar, etc. So that'll be interesting. And also I, what I think will come, although it hasn't come as quickly as maybe some of us thought was the adaptation of things like um, uh, artificial reality, virtual reality, these kinds, these kinds of things. So that's, but I think that's the way it'll go. I think we'll see more sort of deep uh, communication skills coming through the 
increased use and development of technology. But that's enough from me. I'm going to hand over first to uh, actually to Maria. It's uh, over to you for your input. Thank you, Ian. So my name is Maria Dobrowolska, but you don't have to remember that because my YouTube channel is called Deutsch mit Maria, which is much, much easier to remember. And I also run a language school for German as a second or third or fifth language. And we specialize in uh, levels like B2 and higher, so really high proficiency. Yes, and I'm really happy to be here and I'm excited to exchange wisdom here with my precious colleagues. Ian, would you like me to go ahead with the point? Go straight on in. Wonderful. The three questions. So, the things that I have learned in 2020, the, the number sounds familiar, but I heard from so many people they would like to forget this year ever existed and they decided to go from 2019 to 2021. Um, which I not really can understand because my um, business activity and my YouTube activity and the amount of customers we got doubled last year. So I didn't have a timeout. I didn't have a break uh, to, you know, uh, calm down and uh, learn to how to meditate. So I learned how to meditate on the go kind of. And I learned that basically when you can't go outside, you go inside. And you can do inside so many things. You can learn so many things. I improved my Spanish last year, mainly because I, I thought, okay, to be a good teacher or to be a better teacher than I was yesterday, I need to continue studying, to, to learn, to share my experience with my customers, with my uh, followers, etc. So that was probably my main insight. If you can't go outside, you go inside. And speaking of tendencies uh, for post-corona, which I hope will come very soon, I guess we are now seeing a flood of online solutions for everything. And it's not new, so it's not something that corona made us invent. But when we keep to the basics, when we remember what we are doing and what for, when we concentrate on our goals, uh, we actually don't have to care about Corona that much. So in my surrounding, I have so many wonderful people who started great new projects, who uh, got new experience, learned tons of new things. And they kind of didn't care about Corona. Sure, there are limitations. Sure, we have to adjust ourselves to and our businesses and our uh, projects to the current situation. But it's basically, it's not about the, the context, it's about who you are and what you do. And as well, if we stay flexible, we can adjust to whatever situation. And I'm really happy that I had the experience with it. And I hired a lot of people last year, despite Corona, despite everything. And my team grew to over 30 people now, which is awesome. So it makes me really happy to work with so many people. And my advice basically is probably the combination of the first two points. So don't get distracted by the technology because the technology can't replace the people. And uh, if someone can teach online well, it's someone who can teach offline well, probably. So don't care about technology and forget about Corona for a while. Yes, it is very present everywhere but there are still so many wonderful things to do. And I'm here to motivate my viewers and my subscribers on my YouTube channel, and so are my colleagues. So I'm happy to yeah, share it with you and I'm passing on to the next or back to Ian. Yeah, thank you very much, Maria. Yes, talking of technology, of course, I meant augmented reality earlier, not uh, artificial reality, artificial intelligence all gets mixed up, but good advice from Maria there. And we're going on now to Richard. Richard, where are you? Hello, Virian. Thank you very much for having me here today. It's nice to uh, be part of this. Uh, at the moment, I am in Skopje in North Macedonia. Um, the Balkans have been my home now for over 10 years. And uh, I have been living here because my wife is from here. And we're raising our children, well, our child, sorry, with uh, five languages. So we are, um, we are very much into the whole language learning thing and have been for many, many years. Uh, I run uh, my own channel, which is called Speaking Fluently, uh, on most of the major 
um, social media platforms, so you can find me there. And I also run Polyglot Conference, which I founded um, just over eight years ago now. And I've been working on that uh, with uh, the lovely Anya as well um, from last year when we were supposed to go to Cholula, but 2020 happened and um, Corona decided that it wasn't going to be a beer anymore. It was going to be a virus that would stop the conference. So we, uh, we were on uh, the internet on the webs uh, for the first time and it really did force our hands. So one of the big learning things for me last year was how to get the benefits of an, an offline event online and how to use the benefits of an online event that you can't get offline. So sort of really start to believe in that because I was very much against the whole idea of online conferences and things. I, I always thought that they were a poorer version of of the uh, in-person uh, reality. And, and I still believe that the, the in-person events have many things that, they, that can, they can offer to participants that an online version cannot. However, what we were able to do with the online event was to have, to rename it and rebrand it Polyglot Conference Global. And we were able to say, let's do away with the whole idea of a program. Let's have all of the presentations pre-recorded, adopt a Netflix style uh, attitude towards it and take away the idea of time zones and starts and ends and for, for the daily conference. We could also extend it out over 10 days instead of two or three days. Um, and we were able to then implement times during a 24 hour period where people could take uh, control of language exchanges, learning opportunities, Q&A sessions, and all that kind of good stuff that they could just put in and plot in themselves. So these are the cool things that we were able to do and learn from 2020. Personally, what I learned from 2020 is that I am an absolute sucker for any language that I've never heard of or don't know much about. And there's a course available, I sign up straight away. And I'm still in that sort of mode. So I started learning North Sami, I started learning Cornish, I started learning Scottish Gaelic, I've signed up to a Maya course. And just <laughs> the sort of kind of no end to the opportunities of these courses that were otherwise completely inaccessible to me, uh, being somebody based in the Balkans. So these are my big learning things uh, from, uh, from last year. The other thing that I sort of learned from sort of if I'm, I'm allowed to go slightly into 2021 is that what we've seen developing now is this, uh, this need for spaces where people can meet and gather and have that kind of in-person excitement, but in an online environment in a spontaneous way. And so we've seen the advent of things like Clubhouse that have, have come up. And Clubhouse is a great place where people can get into a room, just talk, they can sign in when they want, they can see which sort of conversations are going in and which areas, go into an event and just sort of chat away and raise their hand if they've got a question or just listen. And this is an amazing thing for language learners because it's an opportunity to hear realia in many languages. So for example, you can hear topics about marketing in Portuguese, topics about, I don't know, literature in, in Chinese, who knows what, you know, people talking about real things in, that matter to them in the languages, as well as language learning topics as well, which are great. Now, moving on to the sort of the next thing about what I would say for advice for learners and professionals, this is my big takeaway from all of this, and that is we can make a mesh and a mishmash of all of these types of technologies to really enhance what we offer. So one thing that I would say to anybody out there who's got a course or got um, a product that they're selling, use these technologies like Clubhouse, set up a study group for after your classes for your students to meet up in and for you to also attract new people who might just come across you by happenstance in the app itself. You can then show them how you teach, the kinds of materials you use, go through them, use that opportunity to, to revise and refresh, and you'll bring more people to you through that way of giving something freely, you're bringing people to you. So I think that's probably in terms of people offering a service, that's a really good way of doing it. But for language learners, it's excellent because you can just take the free elements too. And if you're a solid language learner on your own, that might be the best thing that you get out of it. At the moment, I'm doing five uh, sessions a week of Korean. So I'm completely in the, right in the zone with that um, for, for Clubhouse and uh, not paid by Clubhouse, should I say, but, um, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's, it's been a great learning experience. 
Richard, thank you very much. I'm absolutely exhausted after listening to all the things that you are up to. Um, Richard, Richard, as he said, in North Macedonia and Maria and I in Germany, but I think now we're going to go further afield. Anya, where are you? Hello, thank you, Ian. Um, I am in Mexico. Um, I wasn't born here, uh, as you can tell, maybe. I was born and raised in Germany, um, but I moved to Mexico about seven years ago. Um, and um, yeah, so what I do here in Mexico, I have a company called Zaloa Languages, and we focus mainly on uh, helping others to learn German and Spanish and uh, indigenous languages that come from Mexico. And as Richard uh, already told you, uh, I've been helping organizing the Polyglot Conference last year and this year as well, since it was supposed to happen here in Mexico. Um, yeah, and talking about 2020, I think what I have learned from 2020 is especially the importance of, of communities. Um, so when I learn languages, now I, I focus a lot on, on indigenous languages from Mexico. And um, whenever I learn languages, I'm not this typical person who uses like books and, and studies for hours at home. I usually learn through people and with people. And so when this whole thing started, so for example, I was very much used to go to the local market every week or even two or three times per week. And then when the whole Corona thing started, I thought I cannot go there anymore, even though it wasn't closed, but I didn't want to go there because I felt it like one of the biggest risks going to a local market here. And so I realized that it was harder for me to actually go out there and practice the language because especially with indigenous languages, it's, it's, it's not that much that you find communities like you would find it for German or Spanish or other languages, but there is. And those communities have been growing the past year in a like doubled or even tripled Facebook groups, but also um, I've just started with the whole Clubhouse thing. And even there we're getting started with indigenous languages. Um, and I think this whole community thing is something that I have learned from, from 2020 that to me, it is so important to have a community when I learn a language, to not feel alone on my journey and also to create communities for others who want to learn languages that I help with, so Spanish, German or indigenous languages. And so talking about those communities, I think this is something that is is also going to stay afterwards because now we're so used to um, being in contact with with people that we would have not have met or or events that we participated in and and without Corona we maybe would not have been able to travel to those places, and so I think this is definitely something that is uh, going to stay even after um, the whole Corona crisis. The communities, like for example, we said the Polyglot Conference, the online version people really enjoyed it. And, and it's not only the event itself, it's also they stayed in contact afterwards and, and used the community afterwards. Um, we've been organizing just this month, like three weeks ago, the Deutsch Fest, which is um, an event for Spanish speakers from Latin America, from Spain, um, who want to learn German and the same, like otherwise those people wouldn't have been able to participate. And I think this is definitely a huge advantage of like participate in being part of something um, that does not depend on your location. And then my advice for others, um, I think it's a lot about motivation in general. So what we have seen last year is that there is events in this world happening that we can't control. Um, but there is this saying that says um, it's 10% what happens to you and 90% how you react to it or what you make out of the situation. And I think that's very true. So there is a lot of events that we just can't control, like the coronavirus, but also, I don't know, friends, family, work. But that should never stop us from reaching our goals because in the end, 90% is how we react to those uh, events, to those situations. And I think um, that's for language learning, especially very, very, very important. That's it. I, yeah, and I think it's uh, Steve Malmore. 
Yeah, thanks very much, Anya. I think a lot of us can relate to what you said, that although in, on the one hand, there have been a lot of people that we haven't been able to get together with physically that we would have liked to, to actually meet up. And at the same time, we've met up with many more people that we probably wouldn't have had contact with if it hadn't been for the, uh, if it hadn't been for the pandemic. So yeah, thank you very much indeed. And now we're heading north. We're heading north, north, north. Steve, come on in, where are you? Oh, I'm in Vancouver, British Columbia. <laughs> and uh, very happy to be able to join with uh, all my good friends that I've met on various occasions, uh, virtually and uh, in person. Um, so I am a co-founder of Link, L-I-N-G-Q, a language learning platform co-founded with my son. Um, I have a, a YouTube channel called Lingo Steve, where a couple of times a week I put out videos where I try to encourage people to uh, learn languages and uh, to not take it too seriously, um, or speak sometimes in other languages. Um, what I have learned about myself in 2020, first of all, I think uh, we were fairly lucky here in, in British Columbia. They, uh, I think they managed it quite well. We were never really totally locked out and we never had a great big, I mean, it's, it's picked up a bit right now, but people are fairly responsible. We had this lovely lady telling us what to do and everyone basically respects her and whatever she tells us to do, we do. Uh, so it's been not as severe as in say the Czech Republic I see right now or Germany where things are again, yeah, getting bad. But what I learned about myself was, um, I guess, uh, I'm into right now sort of exploring uh, Persian, Arabic. Uh, I, I backed away from Turkish because I want to get better at reading the Arabic script. But, but when you get into learning these other languages, you realize the extent to which our education system in the West distorts history. And, and when you realize the extent to which Central Asia uh, has been dominant you know, in world history in so many ways, uh, connecting uh, China to India, to the Arab world, the Muslim world, and all of this kind of thing. So I, what I learned about myself through my language learning was to have a, a, a little broader perspective on, on history. And I think that's a good, uh, that's something that I, I have experienced before when I got into Slavic languages or Asian languages, that it enables you to discover other parts of the world that our education system tends to uh, not really uh, give us that much. The other thing I learned is, you know, I had to do a, um, a video or an interview in German, and my German is pretty bad. So I went and got a book, Gelassenheit. Has anyone read the book Gelassenheit? Apparently it was a bestseller in Germany. That's what it said on the book. Maybe it wasn't a bestseller. But it's sort of a German presentation of Stoic philosophy. In other words, as Anya just said, it's not, it's not what happens, it's how you deal with what happens. And you don't have to get excited or get angry or argue or whatever. Does it really matter? No, it doesn't matter. So back off. That was kind of the message. And I think that's a very important message. And um, it applies to language learning. And uh, again, I, I'm a, a great fan of this Manfred Spitzer. I happen to have his book handy uh, where he talks about language learning. And so as part of preparing for my German, uh, you know, online interview or chat, I, I started following Manfred Spitzer's, some of his YouTube videos. And it's very interesting what he says about language learning. And that is that our brain, well, not about language learning specifically, but about how our brain learns. And that the brain has a lot of trouble with detail. It, it forgets details in the hippocampus or wherever that's supposed to, you know, short-term memory. But from this constant exposure to language or two events or two bits of information, the brain starts to create patterns. And these are the patterns that enable the brain to manage our lives for us. And so we should be more patient at our inability to remember things and, and, and just have confidence that the brain gradually is putting it all together if you continue feeding it enough input. And I think that's obviously, uh, obviously true. And that helps guide me in my language learning. And that'll, I'll get back to that in the wish side, but just briefly on new tendencies that will stay. Of course, uh, as with Maria, uh, the link business grew because of, of COVID. Uh, and of course, we're very lucky because somebody who worked in a restaurant has lost their job. The, the, there's no bright side to COVID for those people. Uh, someone who works in a meatpacking plant where they're very susceptible to COVID, there's no bright spot for them. But for, for us in Link, there's a bright spot. We've got more people studying, you know, uh, online. 
uh, we're struggling to get a new version out. And so we have increased the number of, of uh, developers we have working on it. And we have two developers in Ghana working on our uh, mobile. And so we now have developers on five continents, which is amazing. So we have, you know, customers on five continents. We have, we have one person in Bolivia. We have a person in Korea. We have a person in Ghana. We have people in Eastern Europe, which is amazing. And that's not going to change. That's the world that we live in, the new world. People fight globalism. Good luck on that. Um, so insofar as a wish is concerned, uh, getting back to this idea that, we, we, uh, you know, as Anya said, it's not what happens, but how you react to it. I wish people would be less demanding of themselves when it comes to language learning, less frustrated, less unhappy about what they forget, except the fact that the brain is slowly learning. The brain learns. As Manfred Spitzer says, the brain cannot do otherwise than learn, but it learns slowly. So that would be my wish. Just relax and enjoy the process. Unmute. We should have learned that by now to unmute before we speak. Uh, thank you, Steve, very much for that. Very, very interesting. Now, um, we have about 10 minutes, I think, from uh, left in our session. So do we have any, Ekaterina, are there any questions that have come up that you've seen or um, from the chat? If, if you have any uh, comments or questions, just put them in the chat box. Um, thank you very much to everyone. I have seen until now just one question from Mario. How do you open up your own language school resources funding? Would be glad to get some info. Um, I think it is a little bit too general. Uh, but maybe one of you can uh, take over answering the question because I think you all have in your way experiences with opening your school or online school or courses. Who would like to give some tips? You know, I'll just say one thing. <laughs> My experience is that it happens slowly and yet it grows. If you get started, you get out, other people will present their perspective. At first, it seems like you're not getting anywhere, but you just stay with it and it grows. And then if you look back two, three years, you know, prior and you'll see just, it has, didn't seem like you were growing, but in fact, you've grown quite a bit. That's just my two cents. In my case, I guess it's a bit different because, um, well, I have, coming from, from Germany, I have founded my company first in, in, in Germany which made it in the beginning easier and then moved it to Mexico where I was already living back then. And I think in terms of like how you start it, it's hard to answer in just like 30 seconds or less. Um, but a general advice would be to know the local market where you have uh, your company based um, for the whole administration and administrative matters. Um, and second, I think that's the, the biggest advice is um, to have a true passion for that. So if you, if you want to help people learning a language, because as Steve said, like there will be definitely things um, that don't go the way you, you've planned them to go. So if you don't have the real passion behind what you're doing, if you don't have the passion of sharing languages with others, then it's not going to work, in my opinion, and that's what I've observed with other uh, people. So I think uh, that's the first question you should ask yourself before getting started. Is there really a true passion and are you really willing to do that, not only for the next six months, but maybe for the next five or ten years or even more? <laughs> and also maybe you don't think about business in the first place. You, you think about the quality content especially because we are in education we don't sell stuff we sell education so my probably most valuable insight was to stay with the people to to think what can i offer them and if a business growth grows out of this thing it's a wonderful thing but you never start with a plan oh let's make some money so let's open up a, a language school it doesn't work like that or it dies really quickly Um, I saw a very different uh, question. It's uh, another topic. Um, are, are there any further comment or tips on language learning process? I think 
maybe one tip because we have polyglots here if each of you can give one tip or suggestion on the language learning process apart from you know relaxing and not willing uh, to learn everything on the day one uh, it would be great for our visitors steve would you like to start just the biggest uh, piece of advice uh, on the language learning process well, I'm a great believer in, in sort of the input hypothesis. Uh, yes, you have to speak and eventually you have to speak a lot, but you have to get the language in you before you can speak, before you can understand. So find subjects of interest, things that are of interest to you and spend a lot of time with the language. And, and then when you have the opportunity, by all means, speak and speak without worrying about how you sound and the mistakes you make. Thank you. And Richard? I'm a great believer in actively thinking and considering what you're listening to or what you're learning at the time. So doing your best, even if you're not speaking, as Steve says, even if you're that kind of learner, um, I'm sort of good out there and just, I say everything that I come across and repeat it to everyone like a parrot. That's just me. Um, but <laughs> you can, you can, if you do something active in your brain to sort of consider what you've been listening to and try and recall the words or the phrases that are connected to these points of interest or the, the topics that you've covered. I think it's a very good exercise for your brain to just um, have additional contact with the language. And when you realize that you don't remember something, um, you can either make a mental note and when you go back and sit down again and you come across it, you go, ah, there's almost like an aha moment because you're doing it in a very active and very conscious way. Thank you. I think Anya is also on start <laughs> because your microphone is on. <laughs> oh, my microphone is still on. Okay. Um, yeah, I think um, the purpose is, is, is very important. So I usually um, have always goals in, in my life, what I want to achieve and uh, focusing on those goals. And when you learn a language, like for many people, the goal is, uh, I don't know, job related or uh, moving to another country. That's another reason. But the goal can also be, for example, to train your brain, right? Which is usually um, uh, my uh, goal as well. Um, so think about your goal when you learn a language, your purpose, um, and uh, set also smaller goals and not just being fluent in the end, because that's a long way. So if you want to go through all that process, like also set smaller goals in the beginning. Thank you. And Maria, you probably also have. Of course, I do. <laughs> so probably my, my best practice is that you are the best language teacher for yourself. No one, no teacher, no software knows how you learn best. So you should explore, you should remember what worked for me, what didn't work for me. And we have so many customers who come in and say, I can't learn languages, I hate grammar, I hate structuring, and I say, okay, then don't do it, what's the problem? Yeah, but I was taught it should be like this, so there is no should be like this. You watch different polyglots, you grab whatever looks attractive to you, and if you prefer listening to Rammstein to improve your German, just go ahead and, and listen, it was not paid by Rammstein. <laughs> Thank you. Ian, do you also have an answer? I would say what's I would back up what, what people have said and particularly focus on what you're interested in because I mean if I take a topic that I'm not even interested in English and I maybe don't even know the vocabulary in English of the every type of tree for example then it's not going to help me very much if I try to do that in German or Spanish and whatever and the other thing I I remember from my uh, my experience of learning German is that I had a tendency when I'd formed a uh, you know a sentence and said it that I was almost like I was waiting for people to applaud the fact that I'd, I'd said a correct sentence and this is not, not what we do in normal communication um, we don't applaud each other on uh, our you know our, our communicatively good sentences maybe we should but we don't and so don't be put off when people's reaction is is uh, just to sort of um, unless they're looking totally bemused um, just keep going that you're that's how communication works sometimes we sometimes we laugh when people say something sometimes we smile sometimes we have blank faces that's just that's just normal so don't be put off i usually have blank blank faces 
um, <laughs> just the last question before we finish, because I think also, I don't know, um, probably all of you have learned uh, languages with different um, writing systems. And do you, can you give a tip for learning a language with a new, a different writing system? Uh, Richard, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. So um, I, I really like the idea of writing words that you already know um, in either your own language or another language in the script, um, simply because and it, it sort of it gets rid of the issue of I don't know the word and I don't know how to pronounce it. So if you're looking at names of cities that are common, like London or Berlin or something, and you already know the word, that's not an issue. If you're able to read things like that in the beginning, particularly when you look at Cyrillic or you look at um, Greek, uh, these kinds of things. Japanese, possibly it doesn't work as well in because in Japanese, they have a number of different alphabets and one is specifically for foreign names. So it wouldn't work for Japanese, unfortunately, in the same way, because you just need to learn lots of the words in the original um, hiragana instead of just katakana, which is for foreign words. But for other languages that use scripts, uh, absolutely it works. So Greek, um, Persian, Arabic, um, Armenian, Georgian, um, so other other types of scripts that you might get around the world, it, it will work. And it's a, it's a really nice way to just gently ease yourself into getting used to reading it. and reading things that you're, you're learning to, to sort of say as well, basic stuff in the beginning, because it takes time to, for it to really flow. Um, so yeah, and don't beat yourself up on it because um, different people will take to this more quickly than others. It's a thing that has to go with your natural rhythm. Right, Anya? Um. Yeah, two things that I would say. First of all, I think it's um, important to learn them from the beginning. And I think there is different opinions out there. When I started learning uh, Mandarin or uh, Japanese as well, I, I tried to learn it right from the beginning. And I think it, that helped me a lot to connect with the language because otherwise I would only be able to pronounce a couple of words but not really read it. So. There is people telling you maybe uh, don't start with it, but I personally think you should start with it to also have this connection with the language. And then second thing, what I've realized was harder for me, like using apps or or any computer systems made it easier for me because I would like recognize the shapes. But then what I found really hard was handwriting. So like no way I could like identify <laughs> what it meant. So I think that's also a challenge, like try to not only use computer systems, but also to read handwriting, which is way harder. And then also to practice not only on the computer, but really with your hand, handwriting on it, uh, in your book or whatever you use, some sheet of paper. Um, I think that's important too. Yeah, I can also only agree with you. Uh, Maria, do you have well, I basically never got very far with learning uh, Arabic. I tried several times, then I uh, turned my attention to teaching German to Arab speaking people and basically came back to the problem that they were beating themselves up because they couldn't read German so quickly. They said, have you ever looked at the different scripts like Arabic and German? They're totally different. So you should celebrate yourself for every effort for everything that you did right instead of saying oh look so many people learned so so good german and i can't do that so this is basically what i deal with every day i'm telling people to be patient with themselves so like richard said just just be nice to yourself a little nicer than yesterday great advice and steve um, yeah, in my own experience, uh, my approach to Mandarin Chinese was different from the approaches that I took to, you know, Russian, Greek, uh, Hangul, etc. For Chinese, I wrote by hand and I had to because I was on a course where I had to write. And I think it helped a lot because the characters, you know, it's so difficult, so many strokes in each character. And I also spent the first month with only pinyin. So I got used to words, hearing them. And then as I learned the characters, I could associate them with the words that I had heard. 
But for every other language that I have learned, Russian, Japanese, Korean, Arabic, whatever, I don't write. I don't write because I have no obligation to write. I lived in Japan for nine years. I never wrote. Uh, so I'm not strictly dealing with reading in those languages. And what I would say is, is to follow up on what Maria said, it takes a long time. Like I studied Russian for years. And when I got on to Czech, it was so nice to be able to read in the Latin alphabet. So we are so used to the alphabet that we grow up with. And, and so we might learn, you know, I learned the Cyrillic alphabet. I know what the symbols are. And still it takes me six months not to read P as P, but to read it as R, you know, because the brain is so used to your own writing system. It's so, you know, anchored in your brain. So learning another writing system is, it's a long road and you, you, you slowly, slowly, slowly get better at it. And I'm trying to do that now with Arabic and Persian, but it's, it's a long, it's a long, uh, Sisyphus type uh, activity. It just takes time. So you have to read a lot. And the advantage we have today is text to speech. So I can read online. If I don't know how to pronounce the word, I can click on it. I can hear it. Text to speech is very annoying if you listen to, you know, too much of it. But for one word or one phrase, it's perfectly, uh, you know, acceptable. And so that helps bridge the gap as you just continue reading and reading and reading and gradually get used to it. But you will get used to it. Yes, thank you. Also, agree, Ian. You last. Well, <laughs> yes, I don't have anything. I don't have anything to add to those fantastic tips from my colleagues. From my personal experience, the only thing I would say, picking up Anya's point about handwriting, is I would, I would love to challenge uh, my colleagues here. To, I'd give them a sample of my handwriting and for them to try <laughs> to guess what language it actually is, or if it even is a language. Um, but I do have a wish free. I still, I still have my wish from the from the start. So. Uh, when I was a child and people said you can have w one wish, I used to think, I thought it was terribly clever to say, well, my wish will be that all my wishes come true. I thought I'd somehow beaten the system with that one. Um, as I've got older, I've realized that actually that's not the best one. My, so my wish here would be that the wishes come true of all the, or your wishes come true, all the language learners here, all the language teachers and uh, for 2021. So that would be my wish for you. Thank you very much. Probably the guests will want to review uh, and revise all the tips and suggestions and answers um, of today's talk. And yes, we did record uh, the opening discussion. I would like to thank all of you once again. Uh, by the way, if you go at our website, Expolingua Com Spring Edition, you will find all websites and channels of today's guests. If you don't find anyone, please write us. We will send them to you and you will receive a follow-up email approximately in a week or maybe two with a recording and with all links uh, from today's discussion. Thank you all once again. It was a great start. And I think now we can keep with Expelling was Spring Edition. Join us and have a great time of the day. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Thank bye. Thank you, have an awesome day. Bye, everyone.